As we share God's word together today, I trust that we will be blessed. Our text was taken from Matthew chapter 25, verse 34 um, to the end. We see again Jesus sharing his parables as he had done in Matthew 24, where he talked about, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. And he shared that um, experience of Noah and the time of the flood to highlight the importance of his coming, his soon coming. And as he went on to speak, he continued with parables even um, up to the end of chapter 24 of Matthew, uh, where you had the, the, um, the talents, and we had the, in Matthew 25, the ten virgins, and then we had uh, a couple more of the parables of the uh, that Jesus um, spoke out in Matthew 25. I want us to contemplate on the words that were read in Matthew 25 regarding the sayings of Jesus to the folks who <coughs> had done their best. Before that, let us bow our heads as we ask the Lord to lead us in our thoughts for today. Father in heaven, thank you that uh, we can open your word, that we can listen to you speak to us, and that, Lord, your word will Give us courage and faith and understanding for the time in which we live. Mm. And so bless your word to our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It's now a couple of years since we have seen the COVID, uh, we have experienced the COVID situation. As much as we have come out of the COVID situation, not wearing masks so much, not being um, excluded from families and so on, there is still the threat of COVID around. And I think some of us have relaxed so much that we've forgotten that COVID is still around. It's not mentioned so much anymore. And we're not experiencing the aftermath of COVID. But it's one of those things that we cannot relax about. How many of you wash your hands still when you come in from outdoors, when you come in from the supermarket, when you come in from your place of work? Are you still keeping vigilance? with making sure that your hands are clean and that you're not bringing anything into your home. Because you can still come down with COVID even now. And there are people still coming down with COVID even now. But we don't hear so much about it. So perhaps we're not so cued into how important it is anymore, or whether there is an emergency around. I think of this uh, COVID situation, when we read the scripture, when Alex read the scripture for us, because it was during the COVID time that the nurses were doing overtime, working extra hours, some of them double shifts, some of them triple, sh triple shifts. 
the doctors were overworked and of course underpaid as we know because they have had uh, their strikes asking for more um, revenue to lie their pockets to be able to cope with living expenses. But notice what happened during the COVID experience with the nurses. Can you remember what happened? Can you remember how we thanked the nurses? Can you? How did we thank them? Did we put our hands in our pockets and, and, and pull out a, a good sum of uh, money and place it into a donation box and it went round and they were rewarded? No, we didn't, did we? They had to come out and strike this year to get some upgrade in their salaries. What did we do instead? <laughs> we gave them a round of applause. I'm afraid it didn't fill their purses, did it? It didn't do anything to their pockets and it didn't help them to, to cope with the extra um, um, food and, and, and struggles that they had. We clapped for them. We dedicated a Thursday evening and we went out and stood on our front doors and we clapped for them. I think now, since they've gone on strike, they've really not been so appreciative of those claps. I think they would have preferred some coinage in their purses, in their bank balances to help them along. Isn't it amazing how, in a way, we want to make it look good and, and that we're gracious in sharing our love to them, but it really doesn't do so much. <coughs> I guess I can hear you say, it's the thought that counts. We hear it a lot, don't we? It's the thought that counts. But I think most people would prefer something more valuable and, 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 and solid more than the thought. And they would like to appreciate, be appreciated by something a bit more um, substantial. When I think of the verses that we read in Psalm 25, sorry, Matthew 25, verse 34 <coughs> onwards, I wonder if you take your Bibles and turn with me. And I'm going to ask um, Arthur if you could um, just find those verses for me. And they are well-known verses to us. And when we look at the context in which Jesus is speaking, who do you think he is speaking to? Is it a bunch of nurses? Are there people who are valuable? Are there people who should be appreciated because they're active? in some part of their work. Who are they? Well, they're certainly not Gentiles. They are people of his own community. His disciples are there in the same circle as the people of Israel. The Jews who are very strict about worship and Sabbath. The Pharisees, the scribes, the individuals who pride themselves on worship, who pride themselves on acknowledging God for who he is. 
and for following the rules and regulations. But look at the stunning way that Jesus approaches these individuals. First of all, there is thanks and gratitude for what they have done. And then on the second hand, it's like a turning away from those individuals who thought they had done something really well, but in fact, they had not. Jesus was speaking to his disciples, he was speaking to his Jewish community who prided themselves on being good followers of God. Individuals who understood what it meant to be godly, to follow the rules, to follow the regulations, to stick with customary um, service to the community. Arthur, would you read the first part for us from verse 34, chapter 25? <clears throat> Matthew. Yeah, then the king will say to those who are the right. Okay, so he's he's divided these individuals and he's placed some on the right hand and some on the left hand. So now the scripture starts with appreciating those on the right hand. What does he say to those on the right hand? Come um, you who are the blessed my father. Come you blessed of my father. Take it, your inheritance. The kingdom prepared for you since the the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Okay, this is your inheritance. I have prepared the kingdom for you since the beginning of the world. In other words, I've already got you in my mind. I've already made preparation for you. I've already sorted out the privileges for you and the rewards that I have for you. Go on, read up. For I was hungry and you give me something to eat. Now he enumerates the activities that these individuals have have, have done. The activities that they are going to be appreciated for. The first one is, I was what? Hungry. Hungry. And you gave me food. In other words, you recognize my need and you provided for my need. It was that we were hungry and you came along and you provided that very important sustenance that we needed to stay alive. Secondly, I was thirsty and you give me something to drink. Okay, I was thirsty. So you gave me food, the bread of life. Now you gave me water, the substance that keep me alive. You gave us drink. We were thirsty, you provided drink for us. Next one. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Okay, I was a stranger and you took me in. You made me a part of your community. Even though I didn't belong, even though I weren't part of you, you took me in. You accepted me for who I was. Even though I had been lost out there amongst other people. You took me in, you cared for me, and you kept me safe. Very important activity to show 
our love for our brothers and sisters. Yes, go on, the next one. I need it close and the cloth with me. Okay. I needed covering. I needed to look the part. I needed to be warm and comfortable. And you clothe me. Another very important aspect of life. A very important aspect of community. A very important aspect of taking me in to be one of you. Earlier this year, our government, our British government, offered the Ukrainians an opportunity to come over to England and live with a family. I understood that many Ukrainians took up this opportunity to come to England and the family nominated themselves to take a family of Ukrainians in or one or two individuals. Did any of you um, appropriated this um, opportunity? How many of you offered a Ukrainian family or individual to stay in your home? No. I'm afraid I didn't. I didn't have room. But I wonder if any of you did. It would have been the very Christian thing to do, wouldn't it? But when you stop to think of it, and as we are reading through, the itemized way that individuals were helped, it's almost foreign to us, isn't it? It's almost foreign to say, I'm taking a stranger into my home. What am I to expect? How are they going to, am I going to live with them? How are they going to live with me? How are we going to get on? I don't see those questions in the, in the text. Do you? No. The questions aren't even hinted at in the text. It's just plain. I was hungry, you fed me. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was naked, you clothed me. There's no, um, no, uh, yeah, well, I don't know what you wear, so I don't know what to buy for you or get for you. Are you going to wear my second-hand clothes? Or are you going to eat what we eat? Are you going to drink what we drink? I know Britain... People in England are, uh, are more tea drinkers. I don't know what Ukrainians drink mainly. Vodka. Pardon? Vodka. Vodka. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably at their leisure. Right? <laughs> but um, the, the questions don't come up in the text. And are we to feel a bit ashamed of posing the questions? Who are they? They're strangers. Do they eat what we eat? Do they drink what we drink? Do they wear the same kind of clothes we wear? Uh, what do they, would they like my hand-me-downs? There's a dilemma there, isn't there? because it's kind of foreign to us. I think as time went on and individuals were to stay for six months in a stranger's home, I heard later in the news 
that many individuals were not really uh, very comfortable living in a stranger's home. Let's turn the tables around and if I ask you how, you, how do you feel living in a stranger's home? How would you feel? I wouldn't. I wouldn't enjoy it. You wouldn't enjoy it? No. Why not? I, I, I don't really know. I think there's two different options. One would be that I, I feel that I'm a burden to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, number two, um, those personal things I yes. like to do on my own, you know? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, and those are valid. Those, that, that, that's a valid answer that you made there. Because if we're not geared up to live in that kind of situation, of course it's foreign to us. And yet we've, we've heard on the news over and over of the thousands of refugees who have crossed just um, down there, the British Channel, the, the English Channel, and come over to Dover and even Folkestone. And they've come in these dinghies and were now put up in, in different places. They're here as refugees. Is it that reading the text, we would then say that these individuals were desperate? Is it because of desperation why they would accept my clothing, accept the food that I can give them, accept the drink uh, that I would give them to quench their thirst? Does, does it have to be in a, an atmosphere of desperation? I wouldn't have thought so. However, as I mentioned, after six months, individuals were thrown, well, should I use the word thrown? Not really, no. They were put on the streets. <coughs> because the time was up and unfortunately the the time was not ex extended for them to stay with these with these in, um, families who offered them a chance to stay with them it must have been an uh, uncomfortable experience in many ways some of the ways that you mentioned my brother Resentment, maybe. Because if I'm going out to work, you can't work, you're strange in my home, but you're enjoying the comforts of the home and you're there all day and maybe you, you, need, you need to use the heating and the water and, and you can have as many showers during the day while I'm out working. It's... It's when we come down to thinking of the practical ways that we have to share, it starts to feel like it's a burden and we resent it. In fact, it, it puts our backs up and we're saying, no, I don't think I can do this. I take my hat off to those individuals who nominated their, their homes and their families and, and themselves to accept another person, a stranger and a family to live with them. I really do. And I guess it's out of a heart of, of, of thankfulness and gratitude for what they have experienced in the past. Maybe they needed help, somebody helped them like that, and so they feel it's their turn to help somebody else. 
there are many different reasons why we're able to turn our hearts to help somebody in this respect. There must come a time when we need help. There will come a time when we will need help. And then in our consideration, we will have to think how that help will translate as a person opening up their homes, opening up their cupboards, opening up their, themselves to sharing what they have and how our response will be towards that. Surely it wouldn't be an attitude of taking advantage. It wouldn't be an attitude of, oh, yes, I'll use the heating all day and I'll have six showers and I'm sure it wouldn't want, we wouldn't want to defame ourselves in that way by showing that we are not grateful and thankful, but that we have a Christian attitude towards how people share with us. Some people think that it's a uh, it's a normal thing for Christians to just do these things. When Jesus is speaking here, we think that Jesus is speaking to perfect Christians, perfect individuals who know God and love God and are able to put aside any kind of um, selfish attitude and, and just play the role. It's not that simple. And it's not so simple. Could we go on to the next one, please? <clears throat> I was sick and you looked at after me. I was sick and you took care of me. You looked after me. That's where the nurses come in. And I guess they're special people. I really do believe nurses People of that profession are special people. They must have a big heart to be able to do that kind of job day in, day out, live through it and get paid less for the amount of work that they do. They're on the feet all day. 12 hours a day. I was in the hospital uh, not so long ago. And I must admit, to see the nurses going backwards and forwards, keeping in touch with their patients, and they came in at 8 o'clock in the morning, and they left at 8 o'clock in the evening. Well, I've never really worked. 12 hours a day like that for a whole week like they do. I know Arthur, you work more than that in some weeks, don't you? It's a long day. Many of them lose the relationship with their families because all they do when they come home is eat and drop into bed and wake up the next morning to go out again and spend the 12 hours again. I was sick. You took care of me. Would you do that for nothing? Would you be rallying around somebody, looking after them, bringing them their food, their lunch, their dinner, their tea, fetching water for them, getting things ready for them? <clears throat> All for free. Difficult, isn't it? What is Jesus talking about here? What is the attitude that one must have in order to be able to progress to this understanding 
of the kingdom of heaven. Go on uh, to the next one. Um, I was in prison and you came to visit me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Gee, well, you could say, well, it's in prison, isn't it? It's with a lot more other people. Why does he need to, why does he need a visit? See, and unless you've been locked up and kept away from your loved ones and family, you won't realize what being alone means in a place locked up. But I was in prison and you visited me. You cared for me. You came to look for me. You took time out of your busy schedule and you came to look for me. Is there any more? Arthur? This, this is the last one about what I was and, and then the rationale will answer. Okay. Yeah. Now this is the twist in the whole uh, scenario here. Jesus is commending these individuals on his right hand for being active in looking after individuals that come along their way. And he's appreciating them and commending them. You've done all of these things. And he's now saying, what is, what is the last line he's saying? When did I see you hungry? When I feed you? Okay. So here's the here's the response. When did I feed you? When did I give you drink? When did I give you clothes? When did when did I look after you when you were sick? When did I look when did, did I visit you when you were in prison? I don't remember doing all those things. Where's the detachment? Is there a detachment somewhere here? Why don't I remember doing all of these things? How is it you knew that I did all of these things? And as we read the scenario, we see that Jesus is in, in touch with human life, with he, the human story, and the important things that makes life very caring, loving, and community. If you notice, all of these aspects of life are about community are about loving each other, living for each other, caring each other for each other, and understanding that this is what the kingdom of heaven is about. Why don't they know that they did these things? They don't remember because they don't tick boxes. They don't remember because it's not in their mind to register the kindness that they've done. That's what the kingdom of heaven is about. Not registering what you've done, how much food you've given, how much drink you've given, how many hours you've, you've done nursing somebody, how much time you spent going out of your way to visit in prison. It's part of your Christian human experience. And it seems to come automatically because you love God. That's what it's based on. 
because we have the opposite in the next verses. The opposite is that um, these individuals on the left hand, they say, we gave you food, we gave you drink, we gave you clothes, we visited you in prison. They seem to have catalogued all of their movements and now Jesus says to them, no you haven't. <coughs> In fact, I don't seem to have any record of you performing these activities. It's a matter of attitude, isn't it? It's a matter of how free I am to practice my Christianity. It is whether my Christianity lives within me and it comes out automatically because of my love for God. Not just because of my knowledge of God, my concept of God, but because of my association and my connection with him. My heart opens up because it's the right thing to do. Because you have never done it for the least of these, my brethren, those on the left hand, you have never done it to me either. It's the opposite of those on the right hand. Because you have done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it to me. But we don't remember, we don't know, we just, we just did it out of love. In speaking to the people around him, Jesus was making it clear that no matter how you feel in your community, no matter what you think about your community, it is important that you register your love for your community in this in in these activities because it's important to understand that these are the activities that make a difference in our world i'm sorry this is not gonna this is not gonna help and it saddens me when i remember that we were asked to go and stand on a Thursday evening to the front door and do some clapping. Even though the nurses were not there, I'm afraid I didn't take part in the activity because I didn't see the sense in it. If you've, if you've asked me to give a donation, I might have... Um, rise to the occasion. Stories told, finally, as I close, of a lady who had lost her husband through cancer. She had made a lot of memories in the home where she lived, and so she wanted to move and start over again in a new place. And so she bought herself a bungalow, a distance away from where she lived. She moved into that bungalow, and as she looked around, she wanted to make some changes. 
And there was a, a fence separating her home from next door's home, a, 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 la, a long fence, but it was, it was um, not looking so nice. It was a fence that um, looked a bit grotty and dirty. So she thought, what should I do with this fence? I, I, I don't have enough money to put up a, a new fence there. It's, it will be costly. But I know what I can do, she said. I'm going to look in the catalogue and I'm going to buy some vines uh, that will grow beautiful flowers and will cover up this fence. And so she looked into the international catalogue and finally she saw a lovely vine that grew large white flowers, beautiful white flowers, uh, bell-shaped flowers that would grow up and overtake the fence, climb on the fence, and, and, and it will just be a whole long fence of flowers, beautiful white flowers. And so she put in the order and sent away to Japan for these beautiful flowers. Now she looked day by day, hoping the postman will come and deliver her precious flowers. The day came and the postman knocked on the door, delivered a box for her. A box of many different plants inside that she would plant along the fence and hopefully they will grow up and take over the fence. In opening the box, she examined all the plants. They were in good condition, good shape. And the day came when she set out to plant all of these vines along the fence of her home. The fence that separated the next door from her home. And so she took time, planted the flowers all along there. And she watered them and fed them with the special plant feed that came in the box with these flowers. As she got up each morning, she would go out and you know how anxious you are waiting for these beautiful flowers to grow up. It's as, it's as much as, as you're willing them to grow every day faster and faster. And as much as these flowers were to take at least six months to a year to start climbing the fence, every day she was wishing that these plants were up and running already with their beautiful bell-shaped white flowers. First year passed, no flowers, <coughs> but the leaves were coming up beautifully. Second year passed, no flowers, what's happening? She goes to the catalogue again, opens up, looks. They should be up by now. Third year comes. Nothing but leaves. Beautiful, green. With hints of white in the leaves. But I didn't buy these plants for leaves. I bought them for the beautiful white bell flowers that they were to produce against the fence. She got annoyed. She got impatient. She said, if by next week I don't see these flowers growing, I'm going to chop the lot down. By this time, the fence was covered. The whole fence 
was covered with the vines and the beautiful leaves. <laughs> we came said, I've had enough. I'm going to chop these vines down. Fed up of them. Just leaves. She went out with her shears because she was going to start cutting by the roots. She approached the fence and she heard a voice the other side of the fence. And she said, Who's coming from? Who's there? Hello? Who's there? And she spoke to another person on the other side of the fence. Hello? Who's there? Who's there? And the person said, Oh, thank you so much. So very much. She didn't do that. She thanked the neighbor. That's my neighbor. She's thanking me so very much. What for? The neighbor went on to say, You know, I've been depressed for the last three years because I lost a loved one and I just couldn't get over it. And I've been in bed most of the the three years and I just couldn't pull myself together but you know one morning I woke up and I looked outside my window and I couldn't believe what I saw and the neighbors there with, with her shears in hand and thinking oh I better hold back a minute while I speak to my neighbor. Oh, I'm sorry to hear of your depression. I'm sorry that you were going through a hard time in your experience. She said, when I looked out of the window, and I saw those beautiful, bell-shaped white flowers on my, on, on, on my fence. I, I, my heart just, broke open in gratitude to God. But I'm sure it was you who planted them. Well, the lady is so surprised now. What? White bell flowers in your garden, on your fence? I've got to see this said, I'm going to come round and have a look. She went round next door. Lady opened the door for her. She came out to the back. And there, on the fence, was the beautiful white bell flowers all along the fence of the next door neighbor. flowers came up on the other side. Isn't that incredible? It's not incredible how God blesses others through us. And we many times don't know what we've done and how we've done. And yet we got praised or something that we don't know that we did. That's why Jesus would say, you know, because you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Amen. That's how incredible it is to be live in your community to be part of your community, to be exceptional in the way that you activate in your community, even in your church community. 
you make a difference because of your love for one another. The thanks you will never always get. And especially if you don't look for it, it doesn't matter. Because the flowers will come up on the other side. You know the day when Jesus puts in his appearance and we all get back to that kingdom that he's promised us, that's where we will get our thank yous. Isn't it? That's where Jesus will say all these words because you did it for next door. You did it for me. I want to thank God for all the blessings that he bestows upon us as individuals, as families. That we continue to understand that that's what the kingdom of heaven is about. It's about being who we are in Christ and living his life through us. Then we're able to experience the goodness and graciousness of God. We may not always get the thanks this side of eternity. But we look forward to it on the other side. Let's go this. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for life. We thank you so much for the opportunity of being part of a community, a church community, uh, a town community, wherever we are, Lord. Help us to be living witnesses of your love, your goodness. Thank you for this church and your blessing for each family here. May they grow in your love and your goodness. And Lord, may each family be proactive in sharing your love and your goodness with each other. Thank you for blessing us and may we look forward to that day when you will come. And Lord, we, we know that our thanks, the appreciation that you will share with us will be one that will, we will not even be able to acknowledge because we, we don't register them, we don't mark them down as things that we do to have praise but things that we do because we love each other. Thank you for hearing our prayer and blessing us. Be with us throughout the rest of the Sabbath. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.